So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by Lucas Root, who is based in the US. Where are you in the US, Lucas? I live in um, San Diego, California, Okay. which is a lovely city um, filled with amazing things to do and wonderful people to spend time with. Brilliant. Okay. And so I'm just going to, sorry, go on. uh, Well, I don't actually work in San Diego. Um, So it's funny, people like, they'll say, you know, where do you live? I'll be like, I live in San Diego. And they'll be like, what do you do there? And the answer to that is is actually rather funny because the truth is I don't do anything in San Diego except live. Ah. Um, and I would love that to mean that I'm fully retired, but that's not what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what does it mean? Where do you work? How do you work? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, uh, I, when I started my consulting company, I, I specifically chose to go after clients um, that don't necessarily need me to be on site all the time, which is great. Um, the, the Pokemon company is my largest and best known client. Yep. Um, I've been with them for six and a half years. They do not require me to be on site. And so, uh, I moved to San Diego cause I get to live anywhere I want. Oh, that's fantastic. I love yeah. it. Hey, I was, um, I was looking at your, your one sheet before we kind of come on board and I'm just going to read out your bio here cause I think it's really interesting. So for mm-hmm. over 17 years, Lucas Root led numerous teams on wall street. And after establishing a consistent track record of success, you started your own consulting business, which we've just spoken about. Um, Lucas works with strong brands with a well-funded great idea who don't quite know how to execute. And since early 2019, Lucas had the wonderful opportunity to speak to numerous audiences in North America, Australia, and Europe, who can now add New Zealand to that, as well as partner with both businesses and VCs for mentoring. <laughs> so, I love it. Yeah. New Zealand's going on like it, now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we're finally open to the rest of the world again, which has been a, which is a huge relief. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been a tough couple of years, but anyway, so it, a really interesting background. I mean, obviously wall street, I think most people are pretty familiar with wall street. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, it's more or less exactly what people think it is. It's it's an incredibly high pressure environment. Um, there's a lot going on all the time. It never stops. Um, it is 100% easy, and and in fact happened to me. It is 100% easy to allow the culture of Wall Street to just take over your life. Mm. Um, and you know maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe it's not. It's a decision that every person needs to make for themselves. It turned out that for me it was not so great. But you still managed 17 years, so it kind of been all awful. <laughs> it, it was not all awful. Um, I, I learned a lot. I met a lot of great people. I, um, the, the work that I was doing, I, I, I was operation strategy on the back end of mergers and acquisitions. So the work I was doing allowed me to be in the room with people who have decades and decades of experience, very smart, very accomplished people. Um, and I'm there in the room serving them, helping them execute a vision that they have. Um, it was amazing. It was just amazing how much I was able to learn from these really in- incredibly intelligent, accomplished people. Um, and one of the things that I learned from them is that I didn't want to become one of them. Right. <laughs> good, good thing to know. <laughs> I, I, you know, you can have tremendous amount of admiration for somebody and also not want to be them. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So tell me, um, we always like to start the podcast with just getting a little bit of a sense of who Lucas really is. So can you share with me what you would consider your professional and personal best so far in your life? Mm. Well, uh, I, before starting my consulting business, I actually started three different real estate businesses. Each of them succeeded to some extent and failed to some extent. Ah. Um, they, they were very successful in that they made a lot of money for a lot of people. They failed in that they didn't make any money for me and they didn't last. Right. Um, so I had, I had three failed businesses before I started my consulting business. So walking into, um, leaving wall street, leaving the security behind and I was making good money and there's a lot of security in that. Um, Mm. you know, I was a sought after worker, um, Walking away from that security and stepping into a, a business with three failures under my belt was was a really significant challenge. It was it was really something that I I should have been terrified of it. I was not, but I probably should have been terrified of it. 
And I believe, because I was looking at your profile at Leo and looking at the book, you've actually written a book and it talks about failing forward, right? So I'm assuming you've taken those lessons that you've learned into your consulting and working with other businesses. Yes. Um, I have people that say to me often, it's not a failure if you learn something. And while I agree with the sentiment that, um, that learning is the goal, mm-hmm. I think it's silly to not call it a failure. It still was a failure. Um, it may not have been a bad failure. It may not have caused damage, right? It's not like falling off a cliff without a parachute and, and uh, sending the paddy wagon over to pick you up off the bottom, right? It's, yeah. That's that's a bad failure that causes damage. Like, but but failures are still failures, even when you learn from them, even when you walk away better and more capable of managing your life, including situations just like that, because of it, it's still a failure. Um, and and those failures created the the opportunity for me to be the man that I am today, yeah. and I love that, and I really appreciate that. Mm. I mean, I must agree. I've had a couple of business failures myself, and so I have um, I've been there, and I know exactly what it's like. And yet, yeah, absolutely, took some lessons from it. Fortunately, not too much damage. Um, yeah. And I think we uh, yeah we do learn a lot from those mistakes. But I actually quite happily talk about those failures with my clients because if they can learn something from it as well, then that's fantastic. Hell yeah. Learn from mine so you don't have to make them yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. So what about a personal best? What do you think is your sort of personal best so far in this um, world? I, I don't want to be too terribly sappy, but the truth is I've been with my wife for 15 years. We have an amazing relationship. It is a personal best. Yeah, that's, that is fantastic. <laughs> and I guess she's based in San Diego, is she? Um, she... Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> okay. So she tell... does something in San Diego. Unlike she does, me, she so... does something in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, or I know that you know so much about so many things, but the topic we've chosen today is about productivity, right? Um, yeah. So I'm really keen to hear from you. You know, what are your, what would you, what is productivity, first of all, in your opinion? Mm-hmm. So I think most people think of productivity as getting a lot of work done, which is included, but I like to use a broader definition that gives you the capacity to approach productivity from a perspective of building yourself up. Mm -hmm. To me, productivity is getting the most of what you want out of a chunk of time for that thing that you want. Example, Mm -hmm. if you're gonna go to sleep at night, you might as well have a productive sleep. So you're not doing work while you're sleeping, like you're, 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 you're sleeping, you're resting, like it's the opposite of work, but, but you can still be productive in that when you're sleeping, you're getting high quality sleep. Yep. That's productivity to me. Okay. Now that makes a lot of sense. Um, I actually have a little hour ring that I use for tracking my sleep. So I'm a bit of a sleep nut and making sure I do get good quality sleep at the end of it. So where do people fail in productivity? Um, three things. Uh, number one, I think people use productivity wrong. They really try to use it only for work. Yep. And you should, you should not, you should try to have productive sleep. You should try to have productive time with your family. Mm -hmm. Um, you should try to have productive meals. You should try to have, you know, productive mornings. Um, so the, the first thing is they try to use it as a very, very specific and very focused tool. And instead, I think productivity is more like a magnifying glass. It is not a specific focus tool. It is a tool for specific focus. Hmm. Okay. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, it, it, productivity as a tool for specific focus, it allows you to focus in on, um, when you use it well, it allows you to focus in on what you want out of a chunk of time. Hmm. Okay. So tell me, how would one even start to look at their current productivity, decide, you know, because it's a mindset as well, right? You've got to actually have this it mindset is. that you want to, to become more productive. Where would you even start? And tell me a little bit about what you have done to improve your kind of personal productivity across your life. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've gone so far off the deep end, it's ridiculous, but it's also great. And I've been able to simplify my message down into something most people can consume. Um, the first is, uh, productivity, your day, it actually starts the night before your day doesn't start in the morning. It starts in the evening. Yep. 
Um, most people spend very little time thinking about that. There's a reason for this. Um, your brain keeps track of things. It keeps track of lists of things that you need to work on. It keeps track of what might be about to happen. Mm. And if you don't prep your brain, your central nervous system, whose job it is to make sure that you're prepared for the worst case scenario at all times, like a bear might come through the wall right now. <laughs> it is theoretically possible. It's not going to happen, but it's theoretically possible that a bear could attack me right this instant. And it's your central nervous system's primary purpose to make sure that you're prepared for that so that you survive, so that you can propagate the species. Like, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Your brain needs to keep track of risks and potential risks and all of the things that might happen to you over a period of time. And if you don't prep your brain for a good, restful night of sleep, then when you wake up the next morning, you're already a step behind because your brain spent effort while you were sleeping worrying instead of just resting so your day starts the night before huh. um, next as soon as your morning starts and and this is really valuable you have a brain state that's happening when you wake up it's it's called theta brain state and and this brain state is an incredibly powerful tool um, however making decisions takes you out of theta brain state. Hmm. Okay. And you were talking about mindset. It's mindset and brain state. Um, theta brain state is, is a maximizer for um, downloading information. And I use the word download intentionally. It's not for learning because learning actually takes three separate steps. It's information ingestion. Mm -hmm. And then the filing of that information, putting it in different places, right? And then finally, turning the information that's been filed into a skill. So learning is actually three steps. But the download process, it can happen in a bunch of different ways. And when you're in theta brain state, your brain is primed for downloading. Example. Have you ever noticed when a great storyteller starts telling stories to kids, they go into a kind of stupor? Yeah. It's the coolest thing to watch in the world. The name for that brain state that they're in when they're listening to that story is theta brain state. It's their download brain state. Nice. They're downloading that story almost in the same way as if you take a USB drive and plug it into your computer. Okay. It's very, it's very so that, cool. So then what should one do with that theta state in the morning then? So I'm guessing getting up and jumping straight into your emails is not a great use of that time. It or is state not time. a great use of that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it depends on what you really want out of your life. What I do with my theta brain state in the morning is I read books. I read nonfiction books because hmm. I want to... Um, bring in information. That's what nonfiction books are for, right? I want to bring in that information that's going to be valuable to me in my life. But again, making a decision ends the theta brain state. Theta brain state is the opposite of decision-making brain state. And so if you don't know what you're going to do when you wake up the night before, then you have to make decisions about what you're going to do when you wake up. And this is why morning routine is such a powerful tool for people who are incredibly high productive. They know when certain brain states happen to them. Theta brain state, for example. Um, alpha beta is like when you're in creative mode, it happens in different times of the day. And, and everybody has it happen differently, except theta brain state. It's always true. When you wake up, you're in theta. Right. So people who know when certain brain states happen they maximize the activity for that brain state for that time. So don't make a decision when you wake up. You have to make the decision before you go to bed. You wake up, you have the book sitting right there. You get up, you start reading. No decision, just read. Right. So that's why that it starts the night before. So in terms of, so going back a little a wee step, so yes, getting your book ready and going, right, as soon as I wake up, no decisions to be made, there's my book, I'm going to start reading. What else mm -hmm. do you do in the evening to make sure that you can be completely switched off and not having to make decisions in the morning? I do the same thing. In the, I do the same thing in the evening as I do during all of the other brain state change times throughout the day. 
number one, I write down a list of the things that are in my mind that need to get out of my mind. Sorry about that. I um, So I write it, and what whatever that list is, it doesn't actually matter. But I write down the list of the things that are in my mind that need to get out of my mind. Because, again, your brain is going to worry about the things that are on the list. But as soon as you write it down, it's it's taken care of. It's solved. Like, you don't have to worry about it anymore. So I write that down. Yep. Number two, I write a schedule. Now, from a, from a very... Um, high level perspective, I write a schedule for the entire day, but I also write a very specific schedule for what's going to happen over the next chunk of time. So I'm getting ready for bed. I know I'm going to go to bed for seven hours and let's say 15 minutes. I write a schedule down that says for the next seven hours and 15 minutes, I'm going to be sleeping. It sounds silly. It really does. It sounds absolutely absurd. But it's so easy to do, and the difference that it makes in your sleep quality is actually noticeable. Because the brain is prepared and knows that for the next seven hours and 15 minutes, you're going to be sleeping. I love That's it. Exactly I had never right. even considered that. Okay, because I do do a, I actually do write my schedule out each night before I go to bed so I don't have to worry about things, but I had never considered the sleeping time as being part of that schedule. Yep. Cool. Okay. Yeah, yes. that's very cool. I'm yay. I'm excited. Okay. And so we've, and it makes so we've, perfect sense, right? <laughs> it does make perfect sense now that you said it, but I hadn't even considered it. So, so you're basically, you're getting everything out. You're writing your list. You're preparing yourself for that seven hours, 15 minutes. Or for me, it's going to be eight hours of sleep. And then you've got your um, day planned out in terms of what you're going to do the next day. You've got yep. your book by the side of the bed. Um so you wake up in the morning, you've had your seven hours, 15 minutes sleep and you read your book. Then what? Yeah. So it depends on the day. Um, right. After I'm done reading my book, my schedule is different day over day. Mm -hmm. um, on my workout days, I put on my workout clothes and I head straight out the door. Um, no coffee, you know, just workout clothes, head straight out the door. I'm a habit kind of guy. Right. So I get up at 5 a.m. every single day. I do my reading and on my workout days, I do my workout at 530. And there's just no break in that like it has to be that way because i just like to have my habits that's also that's also the reason i get up at 5 a.m because i like to have my habits yeah um so on my workout days i head out on my non-workout days i start brewing my coffee um i go about my morning take a shower you know shave get my hair done whatever like get get dressed um, getting dressed is important. It's another piece of productivity that I think a lot of people pay very little attention to. Okay. I think of clothing as a productivity uniform. So think about it. Mm -hmm. When you used to play on a high school sports team, you put on your productivity uniform and it wasn't necessarily your game clothes. But there's nothing special about the polyester shorts that we used to wear when we were playing. Am I wrong? Like, <laughs> it could just as easily have been cotton shorts. We were just wearing polyester. Who the hell knows why? But it was different from what we were wearing before we got out on the field. Mm. And our body recognized that change. So it's a productivity uniform. It's, a, it's an environmental stimulus to help your body move into the next state, the next phase that it's going to be in, and it recognizes that change. So the same is true when we approach every piece of productivity throughout the day. When I want to be work productive, I wear my work productivity uniform. And for me, it's always a collared shirt because there's something about this that's just reminding to me that that's what I'm focused on right now. When I'm done working, one of the things that I do is I take off my work clothes, even if they're not dirty, even if I'm not stinky. It's not about that. It's about moving into the productivity of the next phase of my day, spending time with my family or going out for a run or going for a walk in the park. Like I, I can go for a walk in the park in a college shirt. I can spend time with my family in a college shirt. I change it because I want to be peak productive for the thing that I'm doing at any given time. 
It's interesting because I, I think I did and the whole COVID thing and working from home, I used to get up every morning and still put on my usual dress and my makeup and my hair to be prepared. The one thing I mm-hmm. haven't considered is actually taking it off at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but it does. Cool. So it prepares your brain for different parts of your work and, and your life and going, right, I'm now in this phase. Mm-hmm. Love and the it. same thing when we go to bed, most people wear pajamas. Mm. Is there, you know, I, I love this undershirt. It's a fantastic undershirt. Is there anything special about pajamas that's different to, than this undershirt? Not really. No. Not really. Yeah. But, but we move into our pajamas because that's a productivity uniform. And the irony is most people use that productivity uniform and it works well for them, and they've never connected it to the fact that it helps them be more productive at the thing they're doing at that time, which is getting good quality sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really cool. So great. So we've got the different sort of um, ways of preparing the mind for what you're about to do. Tell me a bit more about mm-hmm. the alpha and beta states, because I mean, the theta state is obviously that first thing in the morning, very important for downloading information. Um, but you said alpha and beta was more about the creativity. So, and that occurs um, at different times. Is that right? Yeah. So um, people people really should spend some time studying brain states. Mm. Uh, the the most productive people in the world all have spent some time. They're not necessarily experts, but they're 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 functionally you know let's say they're functional experts. They're experts in understanding the way that their brain works in different times during the day. And this is something I think I it's it is worth buying two or three nonfiction books about brain states and having that be your your theta your theta learning for a couple of weeks. Yep. Um, study the brain states. Uh, is there a particular, sorry just to interrupt? Is there a, is there a particular book that you would recommend that you found really helpful? Um, yeah, I can I can send that over to you. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So yeah. Um, so. Alpha, alpha brain state is the decision-making brain state. Okay. Um, beta brain state is the stressed brain state. Now, the combination of those two, um, which could be like you're in executive functioning and you're drinking coffee. Um, for those of you who don't know, coffee is a stressor. Mm-hmm. That's not a bad thing. Stress is not a bad thing. Like we go work out, working out is a stressor. Like stress is not actually a bad thing. It's a tool. Yeah. We use coffee fairly well in most of our societies. It's a tool. Um, you use uh, the combination of decision-making brain state and stress brain state to be really focused at at getting work done. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, it depends on what kind of work you want to do. I don't recommend trying to be in a combination decision stress brain state when you're trying to spend time with your family. That that's <laughs> that that's probably not the best way to do things. Like, um, just I'm just saying, just saying. <laughs> um, this is learning from experience, right? <laughs> yeah, I have I have learned that from experience. You 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 want to move into a relaxed brain state. You don't want to be in the in the stress brain state. Like it's not useful right then. You, you're training your brain in the wrong ways. Like don't do that. <laughs> um, but the combination of those two brain states puts you into get things done mode. Um, now there's a cost for being in that get things done mode, and this is why a lot of people associate productivity and it's why I use a broader definition a lot of people associate productivity with time management techniques Mm -hmm. and there's a good association there but they're not necessarily the same thing time management techniques are a tool to increase your capacity to be productive they are not the same okay time management techniques that I know of that people like to use Pomodoro technique it's a great one let me tell you why. <laughs> yes. <laughs> First, as I said, being in that productive brain state, the alpha beta combination, what it does to you is it, it actually has a cost. It uses internal brain resources, actual chemicals in your brain that need to be reset over time. The average person needs to stop being focused and these numbers are are studied and fairly well established at 32 minutes plus or minus seven (laughs) Hmm. 
one standard deviation is seven minutes, two standard deviations is another seven minutes, there's a magic number that I'm about to drop that correlates with 32 minutes minus two standard deviations of seven. It's 18 minutes, which is the maximum length of time for a TED Talk. It is a magic number. There's a reason they chose that 18 minute number. It's because the vast majority of people can stay focused for 18 minutes. Makes sense. Okay. And now I have another revelation. TED Talks are designed that way. <laughs> they, they really are. They're designed by smart people who know how the brain works. Mm, fantastic. Okay. Um, so 32 minutes plus or minus seven. Now, I think most people should be comfortable designing their day around one standard deviation away from 32 minutes rather than two. Mm. That magic number is 25 minutes. Now, if you've studied the Pomodoro technique, you'll notice that the Pomodoro technique uses 25 minute time chunks. There's a reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the way the Pomodoro technique works, I use a different technique because I know where my productivity starts to win, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the way the Pomodoro technique works, which works for most people, is very simple. Work for 20 minutes, take a five minute break. Work for another 20 minutes, take a five minute break. Do that four times in a row, and then take a 20 minute break. And that all adds up to two hours. Okay. So what you can do is you can chunk your day out in two hour chunks. So for this two hours, I'm gonna do a whole crap ton of emails. For this two hours, I'm going to do a bunch of really awesome creative work. And then you use the Pomodoro technique inside that two-hour chunk so that you never lose your capacity to be deeply focused during your work chunks, those 20-minute periods. I think this has some merit for people like me who might be a little bit on the ADHD scale as well. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not very good at keeping focus for a long period of time, and it sort of makes sense to think about how you can be focused yeah. um, and in the right mind state without yeah without um losing that yeah okay now i'm going to rewind and yes. talk about what i talked about before going to bed i do the exact same thing at the beginning of each work chunk the exact same thing is always the same i write down a list of the things that are in my mind yep. and then i write down a plan for what's going to happen in the upcoming work chunk and I do that for each of those 20 minutes. I, I actually use different chunking, but, but let's go with Pomodoro because it's simple and people can look it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I do that for each time chunk that's coming up. So you've got that five minutes of rest. And people are like, well, what do I do with that five minutes of rest? Well, this is one of those things you do with that five minutes of rest. Here are the other things that I do with that five minutes of rest. Number one, as soon as you're done with the 20 minutes of work, stand up. Put on some music and dance for one to two. Not kidding. I don't care if you're a good dancer or not. Stand up, put on some music and dance for one to two minutes. Yep. The worse a dancer you are, actually, the better this works. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I've got, it's going to be fantastic for me then. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, dancing will stop your brain from being in focus mode instantly. And it's 100% effective. There's nobody in the world that this doesn't work for, except maybe professional dancers. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but if you just can't get yourself to dance, shadow boxing with the sound effects works just as well. Do, do, do. <laughs> that's right that's right okay great shadow boxing you got to bounce around you got to jab you got to punch you got to do some uppercuts shadow boxing works just as well as dancing um but but dancing is my my go-to i i think most people are willing to dance hmm. oh, so okay. dance for one to two minutes go to the bathroom even if you don't need to yep walk in close the door behind you um, take a moment to allow your body to know that you're in there. There's a reason. Remember, your brain prepares for what might happen next. Mm -hmm. And if you don't go to the bathroom often enough and you find yourself like sprinting to the bathroom occasionally, trust me when I say this, it will happen eventually. You can't keep it off. Like you, there's no stopping your body from going to the bathroom. Like you can yeah. slow it yeah. down, but eventually it's happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
if you do that, if you try to hold it back, your brain will get into this this mode where it thinks that it needs to prioritize your body's needs over the needs of the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's not wrong because you've been teaching it that you're going to ignore your bathroom urges until the last friggin' second. <laughs> yep. So this is a retraining technique. You've got this five minute break. You dance for one to two minutes, go to the bathroom, yep. even if you don't have to. And now your brain gets used to the idea that it doesn't need to worry about it. You're going to go there. Get a drink of water, even if you don't need to. Fill up the cup, take at least a sip, and then be like, you know what? A sip was enough. I really don't need to drink this whole glass right now. But it's the same thing. It's helping your brain, your central nervous system, know that it's not going to get dehydrated over the next half an hour because you just had water in your hands. Mm. And this is removing barriers from super deep focus. Awesome. I'm loving it. I'm going to be dancing in my next break for sure. Oh, oh. Uh, and I, I'm I must admit, I'm, I'm terrible about with the bathroom. I can often kind of work for hours and hours and I necessarily think, oh, I really probably should go to the bathroom. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, wow. We could talk about this all day long. This is fascinating. I, I haven't done much. I mean, I've got a little bit of knowledge about the brain, but certainly not to this level of detail. Um, sadly, we're running out of like time. I said, I, uh, I've gone way too far off the deep end of this stuff. <laughs> so if somebody, because I'm obviously starting this stuff, you don't want to kind of overwhelm yourself and try to do too much all at once. Mm -hmm. What would be the three key things that you would say for somebody who perhaps feels like they haven't been particularly productive in any area of their life? What would be the three key things you should say they should start with? Mm, I love it. Um, number one, break down your day into time chunks that you can keep track of easily. Yep. Maybe it's an hour. An hour is a good place to start. Most people can keep track of their hours throughout the day. Yep. Okay. Yep. Number two, come up with a plan, a very, very simple plan for what you're going to accomplish in that hour for every single hour throughout the day and take a moment to either write it down or say it out loud at the beginning of that hour, every hour, every day. That's it. Yep. Very, very simple. Just that will make dramatic changes in your life. So, you know, it's noon. I'm going to take my lunch break. Well, actually say it out loud. For the next hour, I'm going to relax, not think about work, and eat food. Done. You will find you have more energy at 7 p.m. just by doing that every single day. Wow. Okay. Beautiful. And the third Maybe and final? <laughs> For the, for the next hour, it's 7 p.m. For the next hour, I'm with my family. We're going to be eating dinner. I'm not going to think about work. I'm going to enjoy my time. Beautiful. Okay. okay. Third and final, yep. take notes. <laughs> yep. Take notes. Write down the things that are on the lists in your inside your head. Do it all the time, as often as you can tolerate Sure. And do you recommend doing that sort of physically with a pen and paper? Um, do you have a, do you use an app? I mean, what would you say is the best way to do that for you? I, I do quite differ? well. Yeah, I do quite well um, using electronic tools. So um, wh whatever electronic tool works best for you. I use OneNote. I use it well. I use it a lot. Yep. Um, it's a great tool for me. Um, most of the people that are in the productivity space, um, and, and I respect their opinions tremendously. They say that pen and paper, actual physical pen and paper is far more effective for this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you, if you can tolerate carrying around a notebook and a pen, do it. Mm -hmm. If you can't, well, electronic tools work. Yeah. I actually use a Remarkable. It's been one of my finds in the last year. I love it because it's just an electronic notepad that has no um, distractions, no connections, nothing. But so it actually is effectively a notepad without having to yeah. carry a notepad. Yeah. Okay, great. Nice. Hey, um, wow. Honestly, this has been really amazing um, for me, hopefully for listeners as well. I'm taking a few things out of here that I'm definitely going to start doing. Some things I was doing, but perhaps didn't even realize why I was doing them. So now I've got some structure around that as well. Now you like have written... Pages. I like, well, yeah. Well, actually, just the whole thing of a uniform and taking the uniform off at the end of the day. That has been my, yeah. I, I don't do that. And I think that will actually prepare me to go, right, actually, I'm home and we're in a mm -hmm. different um, place now, which is great. 
you've all, you've written some great stuff um, around some of these things, haven't you? If people want to find out more about you and the work that you do, how would they actually find you, Lucas? Best place to find me is my website, lucasroot.com. Mm -hmm. Or if you're an avid social media user, you can find me pretty active on Instagram. My handle Ooh. there is at Luke Root, because Lucas Root was taken, so it's just L-U-C-R-O-O-T. Okay, beautiful. And to, just before we finish up, tell me a little bit about the work that you do, because you work with a, a bunch of Fortune 500 companies. What is the work that you do with those companies? So uh, the, the clients that typically hire me are brands who don't execute. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a, a really neat way of saying they stay really super focused on the thing that they think they're great at. So, for example, um, the Apple company is a really powerful marketing company. Yep. Most people think that they're a technology company. They're not really. Um, they, they outsource the technology that they build. Yep. And, and they're great at putting together their requirements and selling that that idea that packaged idea they sell it to the world as this is the thing that we're going to give to you ease of use or really great looking thing you know when they got really popular with the with the um with with, with their uh, uh i uh, their ipod yes God, it's been a long time. Nobody has, uses yeah. it. <laughs> no. when, when the iPods like blew up, you remember the 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 white um, ear? Yep. Yeah. That and and it was like that was the thing. The funny thing is, if you go back and look at those commercials, you're like, how does that have anything to do with technology? Well, it doesn't. They're not really a technology company. They're really a marketing company that takes technology that some other people are really really good at making and brings it to you and they're great at it. Mm. I have so much respect for that. Um, the Pokemon company, my client, is similar to the Apple company in that they're super, super focused on building a story. Um, it's, it's not a customer story, it's not a, it's not a brand of marketing. They're building characters and a character story. You could think of them very, very much in the same vein as Disney, right? Disney's focus is building a story and selling that story. Now, um, a big difference between Disney and the Pokemon company, Disney executes all of the other things around their business that has to be done. They, they do their own manufacturing, they do their own distribution. You know, they have flagship stores all over the place where you can go into a Disney store and buy Disney stuff right from Disney employees. Pokemon doesn't do any of that, which is cool. They stay really, really focused. And they hire people like me to help make sure that all that other stuff gets done and gets done well. Yeah, love it. Okay, great. Well, hey, um, as I said, people can get hold of you at lucasroot.com and on Insta at Luke Root. Um, you have shared some amazing tips and tools here. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to connecting with you online. Thank you, Deborah. Oh, absolute pleasure.